Hi, good morning. Glad you joined us this morning. Those online, welcome. We're glad you're here watching in and being a part of our service. So we're starting a series this morning. We're actually going to start and we're going to stop it next week and Pastor Ryan's going to be preaching for us and then we'll, we'll jump into it. So it's all based on the Sermon on the Mount. And so I would encourage you during this series to read through the entire sermon. It's Matthew chapters 5 through chapter really most of our time and then maybe we'll pick it up down the road but read through it now before we get into it I, I think there's some important things that we're going to need to know about it so that's really what today is about I'm going to just set this up because if you don't have the right lens to look through you're going to think of this maybe a little bit differently than you've ever thought about it before so over the next several weeks we're going to be in one part of this sermon and that is Matthew chapter 5. So e even if you just read through that. And you're, we're going to hit some familiar things. That if you've been around church a while, you've heard some of these statements. You've heard the Lord's Prayer. And that's coming up, but that's in uh, another chapter of this. You're going to hear the Beatitudes. You're going to hear things coming up. They're like, oh, those are familiar. That's where it came from. It came from this whole uh, part that Jesus does at the beginning of his ministry. Some, some call it the sermon at the beginning, but it's the first part of what Jesus does as he is setting up what his ministry is all about. And if you don't know the why behind this sermon, because I didn't for years, okay, you just think, oh, this is nice. Jesus says some awesome things, some good things, some helpful things, some things that might help us, some things that might encourage us, some things we've used from time to time to help us in this life. But if we don't know really the why behind this sermon, that we miss kind of the big picture of what Jesus is doing in this point. And perhaps you've heard this before, and you understand this, but this is really important why I'm going to lay this out this morning, that this is the lens we're going to look through for this sermon. And for specifically over the next few weeks, Matthew chapter 5. This is going to be the lens that we look through as we look through this chapter in your Bibles. And it's all based on this. So right before this, so you just back up a little bit, and we find something happens. Jesus is baptized, he goes into the wilderness, and he is tempted. After that, we're told that John, the baptizer, the Baptist, is put into prison. And then we're told this statement about Jesus. Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching what? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, so now this is the thing that Jesus is going to preach, right? So what, in fact, is the gospel of the kingdom? And could it be that's the lens that we should look through when we're trying to understand why Matthew 5 through 7 is in our Bible, what Jesus is trying to say? Could that be the lens we should look through, that Jesus is trying to talk about the gospel of the kingdom, and that's something we ought to figure out? So what is that? It's really good news. Now, we've taken a word and we've adopted it into gospel. We've kind of made up that word, okay? It's really a Greek word called euangelion, okay? And you can all learn this. I'll probably say it enough over the next several weeks. You'll be like, you are what, okay? Uh, so, euangelion. And yes, it took me weeks to figure out how to say it, okay? Euangelion, the good news. That's simply what it means, okay? And Jesus did not make up a word. He didn't come in and start preaching and saying, okay, I'm making up a brand new word. And the word is gospel, okay? That's not what Jesus did. What Jesus did was reach into what was going on in their culture, what everybody knew, and pulled in and said, okay, they've had their turn. Now I'm going to tell you what really good news is, what a euangelion really is about. So I want to give you examples, because this went on in history for hundreds of years before Jesus. That people were given a euangelion, okay? okay? And it's why you should put your faith in the person. And it's going to be a, a leader, okay? Why you should look to him and say, oh, I'll go with you, whatever you do, okay? I'm all for you. Uh, I'm, I'm ready for you. Why you should put your faith, your trust in that person, okay? So, Alexander the Great. Maybe you've heard that name, okay? Alexander the Great had a euangelion, okay? He did. And he was, his empire was Greece, and his whole idea was to unite and rule the world. Now, in order to do that, he had to have some proclamation of good news, okay? Because he wanted to go really easy just beside conquering everybody, and you're going to do what we say. Here's some good news he wanted to share. So 
you can actually see these take place in the world. And some of these are going to be like, oh, that's, that's familiar. I've heard of it. And you've heard of it because it's now something that's just been adopted for thousands of years. But this was his Yuan Gelion, okay? It had four pillars. Entertainment, which, by the way, they did not have a 65-inch, okay, TV hanging on their wall. That means they had to go to something called the theater. So we've showed you some of this before. If you go to a city like Ephesus, the ruins of, of ancient Ephesus, there's a what? A big old theater, okay? And there's all of these theaters in these ancient towns that you can look at. And, well, why was that there? Because they needed to be entertained. And now it's in the great side. I got good news. I'm coming to entertain you. We're going to change things up. And there's going to be theater. And theater is going to provide entertainment. Then there's going to be education. Now, this is where it's going to sound weird, but education took place in something called gymnasium. Okay? That's where really education took place. We don't, we're like, no, no, the gym is for the next thing, right? Sports and athletics. Okay? But no, education took place in the gymnasium. That's, those are the structures they built in order to teach. That's what they did. Teach that. Uh, teach their worldview. Teach the way things should be. They did all of that in the gymnasiums, okay? Then they enter sports and athletics. If you ever wonder where the Olympics came from, guess where it came from? Greece, okay? Ma uh, ancient Greece. That's where the first ones came from. The first kind of athletics or sports, okay, are part of his, you want to go, yeah, I'm going to bring you sports and athletics, and I'm going to bring you health care. One of the things you'll discover, uh, especially if you start looking at the seven churches in Revelation, there are all clues throughout it that they wanted to deal with health issues. For example, I think it's the church of Laodicea. In Laodicea, they had uh, cutting-edge technology to help with eye problems. I mean, Nowadays, you'd be like, really? That's, that's not a big deal. But back then, it was a huge deal, and they were able to help people. They had all sorts of different things. They had hot springs. They had all sorts of different things because we need to figure out how to help you better. So there was this thing called health care, and that was this euangelion. So I'm coming in. I'm offering you these things, and this is what I'm all about. This is the good news of the kingdom of Greece. Now, we can go on. And after Greece is Rome. So did you know that there was a euangelion for Rome? There was. And it's called the Pax Romana. And a very simple way to understand how the Pax Romana worked is that there was piety. In other words, we kept the faith of those who came before us. Uh, there was war where we conquered. There was victory in which we won. And there was peace in which we ruled over. Okay? That was the Pax Romana. If we took over, there would be peace. Now, any short study of the Gospels, there were part of Jesus' disciples who hated Rome. Hate, they want nothing to do with Rome. That was not a euangelion to them. That was not good news. That was not good news to them at all. Now, you and I should not be foreign to this idea of a euangelion, a good news. Because this is the way it used to go around this time of year during election time, Right? where they come on, and I'm going to give you this, and I'm going to give you that, and that all changed. You know why? They found out that negative ads work, and I don't know whoever told them negative ads work, because I, I've seen two, and I'm done. Done, done, done. And they've just invaded all the spaces, right? Uh, this person's going to take your Social Security and cut your health care, and you're going to be, you know, I'm going to have thing, and this person's going to tax you like crazy, and they're going to do this. It's all negative now. But what they used to do was the exact same thing. Oh, I have good news. If you elect me, here's my platform. Here's my, for lack of better words, you on Gileon. Here's my good news. And these are the things I am going to do for you if you elect me. It's the same concept. It's the same concept that goes on in some of our modern day settings. It's here's what I came to offer you. Here's the good news. Here's why you should trust uh, this kingdom and put your faith in it. So, here's my question for you. What kingdom are you a part of? And who is your allegiance to? Now, I, I, I imagine nobody woke up this morning and thought about this. We just don't, right? We don't think about that. Who, who is my, what kingdom? I don't know. I live in Iowa. Is that a kingdom, right? I, is that work? I live in Indiana. Is that a kingdom? I, I don't know, right? We're, we, we don't know how this works. And, and allegiance, uh, I, I don't know. Don't I say allegiance to a flag? Isn't that what I do? Uh, 
See, we don't think about these terms, about king and kingdom and allegiance to, like they did in other times. For example, I'm reading all about right now um, how when, uh, just before World War II, as Nazism started to spread across the United States, believe it or not, that there was a group, really, uh, and they called themselves gangsters, mobsters, of Jewish men who decided, oh, no, it's not going to survive, okay? It's not going to happen here. They had gotten letters. They had received correspondence. They heard from uh, their relatives in Germany what was going on, and they were convinced it is never going to happen here. So they went out and they looked for the issues, okay? They looked for problems. And they knew they had a problem one day in July, I believe it was somewhere in the middle 30s, when they walked in, they, they snuck into a convention center, okay? And on the wall is the American flag. Okay, that's not a problem, except what's above the American flag is the Nazi flag. And then there's a picture of George Washington, but a small picture of George Washington, and above George Washington in a much bigger picture is Adolf Hitler. Right there, they knew their allegiance. Well, who are these guys loyal to? Who is their allegiance to? What kingdom do they belong to? Well, they knew it in a second. They knew they had a problem that they were going to have to deal with with this group. Now, that would be easy, right? We just walk into our home and go, what flag is hanging on the wall? It just doesn't work that way. So sometimes I think we don't know what kingdom we belong to or where our allegiance is. And perhaps that's going to help us in this study on the Sermon on the Mount to start asking questions we've maybe never asked before about what kingdom we are a part of. See, who you put your faith in determines the direction of your life. It's going to determine the direction. It's going to determine where you're going. So when they did this for Greece, when they did this for Rome, that determined the direction that they were going. And the same is true for us. Who your king and kingdom is, is the direction of your life. It's where you're going. It's what you hope to accomplish. It's what you're looking to happen. So, this is the good news from Jesus, and it's a manifesto for a new kingdom. And those are the lenses I would like for us to pick up and put on as we get ready to jump into chapter 5 in a couple weeks. That you should think of it as, oh, these are nice words, this is a nice sermon by Jesus, but gosh, it's kind of long. He says a lot of things. He does a lot of information dumping. How did they ever remember this? We talked about this at other points, but the whole idea is what? He's trying to tell them the good news of a new king and a new kingdom. And, hey, I want you to be a part of this kingdom, this movement. That's what Jesus is doing, giving a euangelion, a good news for a new king and a new kingdom. And for us to ask ourselves, are we a part of it? Is that where our allegiance is to? Is that what is most important in our life? So we go back to that. Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the euangelion of the kingdom. The good news, what the kingdom is all about. That there's a new king and a new kingdom, and this is what it is all about. In other words, be the type of person that God wants to partner with. All the way back to Abraham. Do you know what God saw in Abraham? Somebody he could partner with in putting the world back together that was a mess and falling apart after everything that had taken place. He looked for a person to help him place the world back together. So here's Abraham. And out of Abraham, we get the nation of Israel. Out of the nation of Israel, Jesus comes to die for our sins and rise again for our salvation. And God is at this, partnering. And who is he going to partner with in the world that's going to be about his, his kingdom and him being king. In other words, he wants to turn upside down our lives and our kingdoms. That's what he would love to do, turn them upside down. And you need to understand, this is the group that Jesus had. His disciples were all parts of different kingdoms. They had all were following different things. Some of his disciples, when you read the gospel, it uses the word zealots. Okay? Do you know what the zealots were? They were, we got to get Rome out of here, and we're up for anything. Okay? We're up for anything. Does that, does that mean we, uh, we assassinate somebody? Uh, does that mean we, we carry out terrorism? We don't care. Whatever we have to do in order to get rid of the Romans, um, we're, we're willing to do that. Those were the zealots, and they're in Jesus' group. So guess what they hear? 
we have a new king and new kingdom. Guess what that means? We're going to get rid of Rome. It's going to be awesome. That's what they heard. And that's what they thought was going to happen. So they were all on board, ready to go and see what Jesus was going to do. And I'm sure he was like, uh, no, guys, I'm going to turn that upside down. You have James and John, two of his disciples. And it helps you understand why would his mom, mom, you know, the James and John mom would come and say, Jesus, would you give them a seat at your right hand and left? Why? Well, you're a new king. This is a new kingdom. And I want them sitting on each side. And Jesus is like, no, we got this wrong. You got this wrong. You're looking for a seat of power, authority, to rule over, to victory, to win. And I'm asking you to do something else. I want to flip upside down the way you think about kings and kingdom and who you're giving your allegiance to. See, the kingdom of God, this is what makes it really, really hard, is both the already and the not yet. This is what's hard. If, if, if the kingdom of God just totally exists of heaven, that means you should trust in Jesus and just die, right? Because that's what you should do, because that's the kingdom of God. If that's the only thing, but it's both. It's the already, already here. We can be a part of it. We can follow Jesus. We can partner with God in putting the world back together and bring his kingdom here as part of the Lord's prayer or kingdom come. And it's the not yet when we read all about how Jesus will rule and reign and come back someday. It's both. And sometimes we forget that. And we think, oh, well, it's only for then. I, I, I'll trust the new king and the new kingdom then. We get, we get Paul's words reversed when he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We're like, well, no, to live is gain and then to die is Christ. That Then I can be a part of that kingdom. No, he wants us to be a part of that kingdom now and bring it here. Wherever we happen to be, wherever our job happens to be, whatever neighborhood we're in, it's to bring the kingdom of God here, both the already and the not yet. So, Matthew 5, and I'm just going to give you a little preview of some things we're going to be running into that I hope you won't be, and, and some of you have been Christians a long time, you've been following Jesus a long time, so I'm sure it's like, I, I already know all about this stuff, right? I already know the Beatitudes. I already know all these things. But be prepared for them because we're going to look at these through a totally different lens. What does it look like if Jesus is trying to say, this is the good news. Hey, there's a new king. There's a new kingdom. And this is what that place looks like, both the already and the not yet. This is what it looks like. So when we run across things like Beatitudes, and you're like, I don't know, it's kind of a nice list. Okay, here's what we're supposed to do, or here, here's what people are like. I don't know. We're going to put on the glasses of the euangelion, the good news of a new king and a new kingdom, and we're going to help us, does this help us understand the Beatitudes better than maybe some list we've, we went like, oh, that's nice, but I really don't understand it. Perhaps if we would think about it differently, that it's a new king and a new kingdom, we'd be like, oh, I get it now. Abolish and fulfill. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish Torah. I came to fulfill it. Well, what does that mean? A new king and new kingdom. He's got good news. And that's so important that he talks about, wait a minute, I, I am not here just to throw everything out. I'm doing something new, and I've come to really show you what it's always been about. And then you, we'll run into this a few times. You've heard it said, but I say to you. In other words, I know you've memorized this for years and years and years. And this is the conclusion you got out of that. So he will talk about things that are in the Ten Commandments. I know you guys have learned that. You've memorized that. You've got it written everywhere. You got this down, right? I know that's what you think it means. But with a new king and a new kingdom, this is what it's really all about. I'm going to tell you something totally different and take it somewhere maybe you never thought of before because I want you to see this differently than you've ever seen it before. So there's one more thing I would like to leave with you this morning about this sermon that's really important to remember. That's what Jesus is about to do in talking about a new king and a new kingdom and offering that good news to everybody, okay, is that everyone is welcome and everyone's invited. Can we go back to Jesus' disciples? I, I'm, I, I'm telling you, I, I know the chosen has tried to do a really good job of showing it, but you've got to understand, when he, when he calls Matthew to be part of that group, I mean, those guys would have been, what are you doing, okay? 
What are you doing? You can't invite him. He's the enemy. He's been taking our money for years. He's been ripping us off for years. He works for the Romans. There's no way you got to be part of the group because Jesus constantly does this, okay, that everyone is welcome and everyone's invited. As soon as you think someone's out and someone can't be reached and someone's not allowed to be in the kingdom, you are wrong. That's what Jesus did over and over and over and over again. And I want to show you this to you even in those verses. So two verses after the one we looked at where Jesus is going about preaching the good news. Look what happens. Large crowds followed him from. Now, these things don't mean anything to us. It's most of our, right? It's a list. That's how I read it all these years. What's a list? Okay? It means there are lots of different people, right? From the Galilee, from the Decapolis, from Jerusalem, from Judea, and beyond the Jordan River. Well, that, that's nice, right? That would be like we would say, well, lots of people voted from you for you for Minnesota and, and Iowa and Connecticut and California and all these places. It means something, okay? Because in all these places, there's different groups. There's different groups. And the galley is dealing with a different set of people with different ideas of what kingdom should be than he is in the Decapolis, which, by the way, mostly consisted, consisted of pagans. They, they, didn't, they didn't follow the Jewish system at all. In fact, if you wonder why um, Jesus runs into uh, casting a demon into pigs, and if you ever, if you ever stop for a moment, and went, wait a minute, the Jewish people have nothing to do with pork. How in the world do we get pigs? We get them because on the other side of Sea of Galilee is this place called the Decapolis, and they're not following Jewish rules. They're not following those things. And Jesus shows up and ministers to them just as he would in the cities of the Galilee, because everyone is welcome and everyone's invited. He would do that to, to Jerusalem where he would run into all sorts of the, the uh, official, the, the religious leaders, guys like Nicodemus, that he would say, the gospel is for all. I want you guys in. You need to be in this new, with this new king and this new kingdom. So he didn't look and said, you guys are hopeless, you're done, okay? Yes, he had some harsh criticism for them. He did. He had some harsh words for them at times. If you've ever read some of that, you're like, whoa. I don't think Jesus liked them. He's trying to shake them out of, their, out of their kingdom, out of their allegiance to another king and another kingdom and say, no, I need you here. Follow me. Follow me. In Judea, beyond the Jordan River, these are all different groups that Jesus is determined that everyone is welcome and everyone's invited, and he's just going to cast a wide net and go all over the place to different individuals and offer them the same thing. Hey, I got good news. Good news, new king, new kingdom, new day. This is going to be great. Now, this is the question I want you to think about. To which kingdom do you belong? And again, I don't know. I, I've never thought about that. I've never thought about that. We know what we're citizens of. We know where, you know, we, we, we have certain things. We we pay taxes. Does this mean if I get to be part of the kingdom of God, I don't have to pay taxes? Well, that'd be easy, right? You'd get lots of people on board with that one. It's, it's, it's easy, but we don't think about this stuff. So asking you this question this morning, you're like, I, I don't know. That's great. That's where we need to be. That we're going to jump in this together, read statements together, and, and ask ourselves, which kingdom am I a part of? Where's my allegiance to? And, it's, and if it's something other than Jesus, it's going to just bring it out. And we're going to be like, well, I don't like that. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I want to do that. Because Jesus is going to push it and say, in my kingdom, guess what? We, we, we have to learn to forgive. In, in my kingdom, we, we learn how to do things differently. And he's going to talk about things that are really going to challenge us. But he's going to invite us into this new kingdom. Both the already and the not. Yet. So which kingdom do you belong? Read through Matthew chapter 5. It won't take you a whole lot of time. Do that sometime in the next couple weeks before we're back and we jump into these Beatitudes in two weeks that maybe you've heard of before or maybe you just look at that list and say, what if I looked at this list through the lens of there's a new king and a new kingdom and what does this look like for that with these things called attitudes? So 
join in me in doing that. Let's discover what this is all about. That Jesus had a much greater purpose than just saying a bunch of things that Matthew wrote down. He was giving us good news about a new king and a new kingdom and inviting us to follow him. So let's pray, and then we're going to worship one more time this morning. Heavenly Father, I imagine we did not wake up this morning thinking about what kingdom we belong to. We ate breakfast, got ready and left. We have other things planned for today. It's just not something we've, we've considered. But I pray you'd help us to think about this over the next several weeks as we open up your word and look at this. Especially Matthew 5, as we start with these Beatitudes, that we would think differently about them than we ever have before. That you'd help us understand that your kingdom is both the already and the not yet. That we would just wouldn't get in this mode of just settling for the kingdoms of this world when you have something far better for us. May, may we take up Paul's mantra that to live is Christ and to die is gain. And may we live out life in this kingdom. May we be people who want to partner with you in putting the world back together and, and fulfilling the prayer you taught us to pray. May your kingdom come. That's what I pray. In this church, in this city, in this state, may your kingdom come. May we partner with you in putting things back together and see what you have in store for us. And Father, as we get ready to worship you again, we thank you. that You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you alone are worthy of our worship and our praise. In Jesus' name, amen.